Okay, <laughs> so today uh, we are going to talk or to see a bit of a piece of the infrastructure that we needed to build at CITA to handle some events. So let me introduce myself <laughs> and I'll save you the job. <laughs> Well, it's okay. <laughs> um, Laura Morillo, you can find my Twitter handle there. And um, I try to answer usually. <laughs> Every now and then uh, I forget to check Twitter and then I can spend maybe a week without checking it and then suddenly remind, remind oops, I think that I had something on Twitter. <laughs> And the alerts are not always arriving, but it's, usu it's usually a, a good uh, way to contact me. <laughs> so if you have any question after the uh, event, I usually see the mentions and I, I can answer. As they have said, I'm also involved in several communities. I'm a GDG, that is Google Developers Group organizer. There I have the role of a women check maker, uh, ambassador that they rename it now. And it's a role focused on trying to improve the diversity that we can see we usually lack in the, uh, the tech events. Uh, I work at CTAC as a, a tech lead, uh, but I mostly work on the uh, backend side of an application called SSP, and I will tell a bit more about that later. I've been working for 12 years with a lot of different technologies, like, uh, as he said, Ruby in the past, and Groovy, Java, C, C++, a lot of them. Now I mostly work with Node.js, with uh, uh, Spark, um, with Scala, I mean, um, a bit of the infrastructure part with Kubernetes, for example. And I love working at the startups. Because when you have to work in a startup, you need to learn a lot of things. Because you need to do a lot of things. When I started working at CITAC uh, three years ago, we were a team of uh, six developers to do everything. And we had some people uh, dedicated to work only on front-end things. And the rest of us, we had to work on the back-end and on the infrastructure. So that's why I wanted to do a note. I'm not a DevOps. <laughs> I like to learn new things about infrastructure, and I try to learn more things about automation thing and everything related to the DevOps side. But uh, my experience is mostly as a software developer. But I want to share the path that we follow to build this event system and what we learned in the way uh, at CITAC. I'm going to do a bit more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's not because I want to uh, charge you <laughs> talking about CITAC, but I want you to know what CITAC and the business that we do so you can understand the problem that we were trying to solve. Because I think that it's the most important part to understand what we need to solve and not only the technology that we use to do that. At CITAC, we work with uh, online advertising. So we place those annoying ads that you can see in a lot of pages, but we try to create a less annoying advertising uh, media. <laughs> we work with in-image advertising, so we use mostly to place our ads the images that are inside the, the uh, articles that you read, for example. And I work in a piece that is called SSP. 
it's a supply side platform. With a supply side platform, what we do is that we receive a request to place an ad whenever a user visits a page. So every time a user goes to a page, whenever you go to pages like Marca, Mundo Deportivo, Confidencial, etc., you are also sending traffic to SIGTAX. Then we take the information from the user, uh, the location, the country, from the IP, uh, information like that, and we contact to a lot of different third parties to tell them, hey, do you have the possibility to place an ad here? Do you want to place your ad here or not? And then they respond with bids if they want to set their ad there. And we have to decide here which ad is the best one to place in that spot that we are uh, using at the moment. So the thing is that this is completely a black box for business people. They know that we receive requests and they know that we place ads, but they have no idea about what's going on inside. That's what motivated us to build this event system because they needed to have a lot of information about what was going on. They needed to know if uh, the third parties were receiving or not their request because we were blocking the request before if they were bidding or not, if the amount that they were bidding with, and also who was winning or who was losing, because they need to contact the third parties to let them know, hey, you are never bidding, so we don't want to work with you if you are not going to send us any ads, and that kind of thing. But they didn't really have any information unless we managed to expose that. That's why we decided that we could work with events, and that way we could log everything that was happening from the beginning, from the moment that a request is received, until the moment that we decide the ad that we have to return to the page, or send a no bid, send, saying that, I'm sorry, but we don't have any ad to display you. And we decided that we had kind of two different type of events. We have some events that we knew that we were going to use them to uh, create some reports later because it was crucial information that we needed to store and that we needed to process later. So we have information like the amount of requests that are received, the amount of requests that we send to every third party, the amount of responses, how many timeouts, how many bids, how many no bids the uh, uh, size of the ads that we sent, information that we are going to uh, handle later with some reports that business people will be able to use to uh, uh, get more information from what's going on inside. But we also had some information that we didn't want to process, but we knew that sometimes could be useful. So we decided to treat that information like a kind of debug information. Things like the ad, for example, that is being returned. Whenever we receive an ad, we can receive different kinds, but uh, so you have an idea, when we receive a, a video to place it, it's a quite big XML. So if we are going to work with them, process them, and store them, then we knew that we were going to handle quite some uh, big amount of information. So we decided to start working on which solution could we use to uh, provide this feature that business people was needing. In general, the architecture that we had at that moment for the whole uh, production system, it was based mostly on microservices uh, built with Node.js that were running in a Kubernetes cluster on a Google a Kubernetes engine. We were also using a Spark to communicate some of the services and also to, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, we were using Kafka to communicate some of the uh, services and also to send some messages to a Spark 
that we were already aggregating because we had in another part of the system a similar event service but that were handling no information so big and that now we are also migrating to a different infrastructure. Uh, to avoid uh, needing to uh, manage and, and to need to handle everything related to the uh, Spark cluster, we were using Dataproc. And uh, we were also using as our main database, MongoDB. So these were the tools that we were already using. And we knew that one part of the application we were going to replicate what we had already done to to create our reports and because we already knew that that worked. So we knew that at some point we wanted to have the whole information that was being generated stored somewhere. We have not decided that yet. And from that we wanted to import that information in a Spark task that would only aggregate the information and store in our MongoDB the reports already processed and ready to be served to the uh, business people. So this part was clear and we knew that we wanted to use this infrastructure because it had proved to work fine for at least for what we needed here. But we still needed to manage some way to handle those events and store them somewhere. And when we started working on this solution, the project the SSP project was uh, starting. We were only having some uh, connection on production, not too many, so we were not having too many requests. But at the moment, we are handling around uh, 3,000 requests per second. So we knew that we needed something that would grow a lot. We started checking how things are done. And we started investigating the suggestion uh, by Kubernetes about how to handle uh, logging. Two of the approaches that are proposed, for example, in some of the blogs, are or by creating a sidepod container that will run with your main application and will be the one taking care of the information and sending it to your login uh, backend, or directly connecting your application with your login backend. So in general, we had these two approaches, and we started dividing in different options. So okay, the first option, it would be uh, the sidecar container that they were proposing. We would be using technologies that we were already using, Kubernetes and our pods, and we uh, would be adding only a, a Google Cloud Storage to simply send the information there. So the process would be kind of simple because we would have our SSP process generating and writing information to a file, for example, and we would have a service running in a sidecar container, getting this file information and taking care of sending it to Google Cloud Storage. It had some advantages, for example, that we would be dividing the SSP and the event logic responsibilities. So the SSP wouldn't need to uh, take care of things like rotating the logs, for example because that was kind of completely out of that. And if we needed to do that in a different service, we would already have a service specialized on doing that. We would be also using the, ex the existing uh, architecture, so we wouldn't need to take care of more pieces. Uh, consider that we are a small team we don't have anyone uh, fully dedicated to the infrastructure. We don't have anyone for DevOps. So the people taking care of DevOps is mostly uh, some backend people. So 
we need to consider the amount of work that something will add uh, if we want to use it. And also, with that approach, we wouldn't have any kind of vendor lock-in. In the end, you're using Kubernetes, so if you want to migrate your Kubernetes cluster, your bots will go with that Kubernetes cluster and uh, switching from using cloud storage to using, for example, uh, Amazon isn't really a, a big change. And it would be quite easy in the end. It's simply a storage system where you'll leave the, the log information. So even if that's not uh, really sim something uh, really strong to decide, it was another advantage. In our case, in the end, at the moment, we are running everything on Google Cloud Storage, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Google Cloud. So it wasn't really uh, something that could make a big difference, but it was something to consider. But it also had some disadvantages. First, that we would need to handle and take care of the life cycle of the pod, because for us, it's really important not to lose those events. So we need to ensure that if anything happens and Kubernetes is going to restart one of our pods, we need to ensure that the whole information has been saved and has been sent to our storage. And that is doable, but well, added some complexity because at the moment we don't need uh, to worry in any of our services because of the restart. All of them can recover automatically. We would also need to add some kind of persistent layer to share this uh, document. Again, something not uh, really difficult, but adding again more pieces to the system. And the events wouldn't be persisted immediately because we would be leaving the information inside the pod and at some point the event service would act, would check the information and would send it to the uh, 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 Google storage, but as we said, if we had some kind of not uh, properly handled situation, you could be losing all the information that hadn't been moved uh, on time. The option two that we decided to evaluate was a direct connection with BigQuery streaming. Did you know BigQuery? <laughs> well, BigQuery in the end uh, allows us to uh, store and process uh, big amounts of information. So it's a big database, <laughs> but properly prepared to handle big amount of data. So that was uh, why we decided to consider it because we knew that we were going to handle a big amount. And one of the features that they provide is an API to do a streaming directly to a table. So you can simply use their uh, API and their library because they also have uh, libraries for, for Node. So we would only need to add their library to send directly the messages to to BigQuery, and then we will have immediately all the information persisted, and we wouldn't need to worry about duplication, and we wouldn't need to uh, consider how maintaining everything. So it had some advantages. Simplicity, because we only needed to worry about using a library to connect to the API. and the library was mm, quite easy. You only need to uh, take the data set, take the table, send message. And um, when you are planning to do inserts, then it's quite a straightforward. The events, they would be immediately stored. Uh, it takes a small amount of time for them to really persist and display everything that you are sending through a streaming but it's a, a small amount of time. And since the moment that they receive the message, uh, they store it even if it's not already on your table. So you don't have to worry that if the service dies because of any reason, 
all the messages that already happened, they had been sent and they had been properly stored. Also, uh, with BigQuery, we would already have the information ready to BigQuery and we could get some extra information because not all the information that we can get is always the information that we have in the reports. That's why we also keep some debug information because sometimes there's information that we are not really processing but can be useful. So BigQuery is a really useful tool at that moment. And we wouldn't really need uh, to do anything to maintain it because it's a service. So it's Google who's taking care of maintaining the information that you are storing. The first disadvantage that you need to consider is the cost. As a provided service, uh, you have to pay for it. <laughs> you have to pay for the information that you store, but you have also to pay for the information that you store on Google Cloud Storage, even if Google Cloud Storage is cheaper. Also, you need to pay for sending the information yeah, I I don't remember exactly the price, but it was something like uh, I think a bit less than one cent for every 200 megabytes or something like that. So depending on the amount that you are sending, it could be really expensive or it could be cheap enough. And also we needed to consider if we could have some connection issues because from the moment that we send the event, we know that it's going to be stored, but if we had connection issues with BigQuery, then we would be losing a lot of events. And we hadn't used BigQuery before, so we didn't really know how well this could be. The third option that we decided to uh, evaluate, it was based on Kafka and Spark. We already had a system sending some kind of events to Kafka to be later processed by a Spark. So we could use a similar approach to send the message from this SSP directly to the uh, Kafka. From our Spark server, we could connect to the uh, Kafka, read the different messages, process them, and write some batches of information to Google Cloud Storage to generate the log files. The advantages that we were already using, and we would be already using the existing infrastructure, so we wouldn't really need to worry of maintaining anything else, but we would need to consider uh, how it could affect the existing infrastructure, the amount of information that we were going to send now because we were going to handle a lot more information than we were handling before uh, through our uh, Spark system and through our Kafka. The cost was quite controlled because we knew that even if we needed to scale a bit that in infrastructure, we could, need some, uh, we could need to add some machines to the uh, clusters, but uh, it was easier to control it and uh, it, w it is not uh, so directly the, the increase. Uh, when you are sending a service uh, like BigQuery, receiving uh, 300 messages and receiving 600 messages can really make a difference on the cost that you have. But when you have a sp uh, your own infrastructure uh, handling 300 messages or 600 messages, depending on the load, can mean adding a bit more or needing a bit less, but it's not uh, that much the amount that you need to grow to handle that. And uh, with our Kafka, the data would be already immediately, uh, it would be again uh, immediately stored because Kafka handles the persistence so every message that we send, it would be already stored there to be read later. So even if the SSP fails and or is restarted, then 
we could still read the information from the Kafka queue. The disadvantages, well, we having we we would have uh, we started having a lot of pieces involved to do only one thing because we need Kafka, Spark, Cloud Storage, so a lot of things, a lot of pieces to handle together. And something that also worries us it was the event size. As I said, uh, we have uh, two kind of events the uh, uh, report ev events that we call them uh, they are quite controlled because we only send the properties and the information that we know that is going to be needed uh, to do some reporting but with debug events we are sending a row event containing everything that is happening even the whole creative so even a XML that contains the whole information about a video that needs to be displayed with a lot of URLs that will track if the user sees, uh, uh, starts seeing the video or sees half the video or yeah, <laughs> everything is tracked, everything, yeah. So the uh, uh, XML files could be quite big for Kafka messages. It's probably a more than uh, a double of the uh, recommended size. So it's a recommendation, so you can increase it, but you know that the performance of your Kafka can suffer because of that. So we were a bit worried with that. Considering the three options that we had and evaluating everything together, we decided to go with the BigQuery streaming approach. <laughs> Why? Because it was the fastest for us to implement and test. We didn't need to spend any time working on the infrastructure because everything was going handled by Google. We only needed to handle the connection with, with, with BigQuery, so that was quite a straightforward. And the team, we are only two people, <laughs> So we didn't have a lot of people to work on different parts. And as I said, we don't really have someone working on the infrastructure. And the project was just starting. So we needed something to prove that it could work and that it was a useful tool and that it could later uh, grow. As I said, well, the whole infrastructure was the SSP sending directly using the API messages to BigQuery. And after that, we had uh, uh, a Spark task, a Spark uh, a kind of service that would import uh, hourly and directly the information from uh, certain BigQuery tables would aggregate the information and would generate the report and store everything on the Mongo. Having everything together inside Google was a big advantage here because we didn't suffer almost any connection issue with BigQuery. That was one of the worries that we had when we were planning everything. And also the connection between the Data Pro cluster and BigQuery, it's quite easy. It has a, a, a library that automatically uh, sends the request to export the information. And uh, the library automatically sends the information from BigQuery to a cloud uh, storage, and then imports the files to be processed uh, with its Spark. So we were quite happy with this solution because we also had the information to use it immediately if we wanted to do some custom queries uh, with BigQuery. So cool, solved. We already had our infrastructure working and we had the business needs solved. But no. <laughs> 
we were really happy with our system and we could use it for uh, four months, more or less. No, maybe I mean more, maybe probably six months, something like that. And then we uh, started facing this. Google has some limits. Depending on the product that you are using, you can face some kind of uh, soft limits that you can request for them to be increased, or some hard limits like this. When we started working, you were limited to 10,000 rows per second per table and 100,000 rows per project. When we started, that was, uh, it wasn't an issue at all. It's like, wow, it's a rich problem. <laughs> but after a few months, when we started running a lot of things in production with the SSP, because it was working and it was a useful tool that they wanted to use, we easily started going over the 10 hundred rows. After that, they increased the limit per table, and now I think that it's, only, uh, it's also uh, 100,000. Uh, but at the moment, we, on peak times, we are handling around 160 thousand events per second. So this wasn't a solution for us anymore. We needed to reconsider again everything. <laughs> so <laughs> it was right, and I think that we really chose the right tool at that moment because we needed something that could fix the necessity that we had at that moment, and we did something fast, and it worked. But we needed to consider now the right tool that could properly scale with our necessities and with the uh, scaling necessities that we were really having at that moment. So we had to decide. And we decided to go to the Kafka and Spark. Why? Because in the end, it was quite similar to what already ha we already had in another parts of the system, and it was already infrastructure that we knew that could work, and we didn't need to face some other strange problems. We only needed to ensure that the size of the messages wasn't really a problem. The whole process now had a lot more pieces, and we didn't know if it was going to be uh, maybe some kind of problematic mixing everything together. The whole process now was that the SSP was sending messages to Kafka. We had an Apache Spark task or oh, um, a service reading the information from Kafka every five or ten minutes, depending. We have been playing with that taking all the messages to generate files and save those files to cloud storage. And a different job runs every hour and daily to take the information from the cloud storage and generating the report uh, to uh, saving the information to Mongo. After checking the different options that we had with uh, Spark, we decided that we were going to use a Spark Structure Streaming. We had been using a Spark Streaming before, and it worked fine, but we had some issues when persisting the offset sometimes. And even if in the other system, we didn't really worry that much because of that kind of issues, because it wasn't really a problem if some event was duplicated. In this case, as we were going to use the information for things like uh, uh, sending the invoice to the client, we needed to ensure that we were not losing events and that we were not duplicating events either because we don't want to uh, charge more than we should. So Spark Structure Streaming, if you don't know, 
uh, I really recommend you to have a look of it because it's a system that is fast and scalable, so that meets uh, our needs because we needed something that could really scale to our needs. It's also full Cherryland and provides the ability to uh, ensure that the documents are processed exactly once. And the good thing is that it's really, really simple to use. What we need to do is, on one side, to define a read stream. In this case, we were reading information from Kafka. We set the brokers of Kafka, the, the connection to Kafka. We set the topic, and we are using two different topics. We are using one topic for the report uh, events that we want to ensure that are going to be always working and that uh, uh, we don't have any issue with that topic. We really need to ensure that. And another one for debugging, where we know that we can be less strict, and if we have some problem with that, it's not really a big problem for us because we only need to run some custom or some, some specific uh, uh, queries and our search to get some uh, specific information. So it's not really that critic. We designed the policy of the connection with the Kafka uh, about uh, when it's connecting for the first time, where it should start, if it should start with the first message that it was sent and is still stored, or with the latest. And we defined the uh, maximum amount of messages that you try to get from Kafka for every time that it runs. Uh, you can see the number is not bad. <laughs> I think that we left it in one, 150, yeah, 150,000, no, 150 million messages. And this is now running every 10 minutes. After that, here we are reading the information. So getting the information from Kafka. And now we need to store it. The code can look difficult, but most of the code, all this part is only to transform the information that we are receiving. To really store the information, we only need this part. What we are doing here is that the uh, messages that we are sending contains a timestamp. We want to ensure that every message is stored inside a folder with the structure year, month, and hour. This structure helps us to be able to process, for example, only one hour or reprocess it later if we have some issue with it. And also, if we want to get some information in real time, we can import the logs from the last hour only to see what is happening instead of needing to import, for example, the whole day. Now here, what we are doing is transforming this time and stamp into date and get it in the end, the year, month, day, and hour. We define the columns that we are storing, uh, a timestamp, a request ID that allows us to identify all the messages that have been uh, created or uh, that happened because of the same request. The event type, it's, it's the event, the name of the event, and the log. It's a, a JSON with the whole information that we want to be stored for this log. Here, we are taking all this uh, SQL information in the end, and we are telling that we want only 10 groups of data. So we are grouping, we are ensuring that every time the application uh, runs, 
it only generates at the end 10 files. This wasn't always here. And what happened was that it was creating a lot of small files. For cloud storage, it's not really an issue that. But after that, we had a task that was importing the whole hour to process the whole hour together. And for that task, having a lot of files is worse than having a, a, a smaller number of files, but bigger. Because uh, the task need to perform uh, before getting the information and before downloading the files, it needs to check the files, list all of them. So it's not the same if you need to list 60 files or 600 files that if you have to list 10,000 of files for every request. Also, you need to get meta information from those files, and after that, downloading all of them. So the amount of requests that you are having increases a lot. So when we change to uh, decide and handle the amount of files that we were generating with every iteration, we improved a lot the performance of the other task. So we create a write stream with this uh, structure and these columns. We are using Paquet, and we will talk a bit more about that and why. And we tell it to use an append mode. So it's the, own, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, right stream is taking care to ensuring that information is kind of appended and it's not replaced. So we are not duplicating any information. We said the path that we are going to use to store. And for this, we are using two buckets different for debug and for uh, the report information. And we will see later why using two buckets instead of one. We need to define also a path for it to store the checkpoint, so it can trace where uh, where uh, oh, um, where finished the task the previous time to continue later, and um, we define the frequency that we want for this trigger. In this case, we are now running it every ten minutes. When we are using a write string to files. And we are, as we are defining also the checkpoint location, we need to take care because if you want at some point to move the information to a different folder, you will need to take care because half of the information about the process and the checkpoint information is stored with the information and part of the information is stored at the checkpoint location. So if at some point you want or you need to move it to a different location, you will need to ensure that you are moving also the checkpoint location or you will suffer some issues. I know it. <laughs> BigQuery, again, now we are not really using it for the process. But the good thing is that inside Google, you have a good connection, and it's really easy to import a directory from uh, Google Cloud Storage to BigQuery. So for us, it continues being quite easy if we need to run some custom queries and to process in a custom way some information every now and then. It's pretty easy for us to directly say, OK, I want to create a table using Google Cloud Storage. You can define the path to a file, or you can also use wildcards. So that allows us to decide if we want to import one hour, one day, or even one month if we would like to do that. But that's quite a lot of information to do it. So we have not really at the moment done that. Because after that, BigQuery it also uh, has pricing for the query. So
So you have to pay for the amount of information that you are processing in every query. So running a query with uh, one hour, considering that the price, it was uh, $5 per terabyte that you process. So uh, one day for us is at the moment more than three terabytes. <laughs> it would be $15 every time that we want to run a query only for one day. So if you want to run a query for one month, <laughs> you can do the math. <laughs> That's why it's quite useful for us to have also the division in hours, because quite often we only need to uh, process the information in one hour to, to be able to handle some information, like, okay, if uh, one campaign is running properly or not, things like that, we can get it directly from the log information that we have here. Um, some uh, kind of hints, if you want to use Google Cloud Storage. Parquet. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, <laughs> it's a, a compression for the files. It's a format that will compress the information. So in our case, here we have, for example, the size of the information for one day as it is stored using parquet format. And it's around one terabyte. And the same information, after being stored in BigQuery without the compression, is 2.5 terabytes. So it's more than double. As you are going to need to pay for the uh, uh, space that you are going to use, it's a good recommendation to consider using Parquet as the format for your files. But it has, for example, one disadvantage. When you are working with Google Cloud Storage, BigQuery has a feature that allows you to create a table that will not contain directly the information, but that will take the information from an external source. So you can say to BigQuery, hey, I want to create an external source that will point directly to files that I have in Google Cloud Storage. So instead of needing to do the process that we are doing here of importing the, impo the information and creating a table that even if it's fast, uh, for one hour it takes maybe two or three minutes for us, so you need to wait that time, you could directly connect to that source. But that doesn't work if you are using Parquet at the moment. Uh, you can use uh, Avro, you can use uh, JSON directly, but if you are using Paquet, you cannot use this direct connection. It's one trade-off that you need to consider if it's something, it's a feature that you need to have, or if it's okay to work with this process like us. Another good feature that you can use is lifecycle rules inside Google Cloud Storage. I said that we were using two different buckets, it's like two different folders, inside Google Cloud Storage for our information, one for the bug and another for uh, the report information. And it's mostly because of that. With the lifecycle rules, you can define policies that you want to apply to your data. So you can, de you can define things like, okay, for information that it's older than 31 days, uh, send the information to cold line. Cold line is a, a, a different kind of Google Cloud Storage uh, that is prepared for information that is going to be rarely accessed. So you pay less to have the information there, but it costs uh, you more if you want to access and to get information from that data. In our case, we know that for the reporting data, after the month has finished, we rarely need to access that information. 
So if we send that information to call line, we will still keep the information, so we will have it if we need it, but we are going to save quite some money. And after six months, for example, we are not going to need the gross information anymore. We already have the reports that we generated from it, it is stored in Mongo, and we don't need the gross logs anymore. So we can define a policy to remove it. In the case of the debug system, as we rarely use them to, uh, to process information, we know that we don't really need to uh, store them for six months because the information that we can get for, from the debug inf uh, events it's information that is more recent. It's, I, I want to know that this campaign is running properly. I want to see the whole creative that is uh, being returned or the ad that is being returned because I want to test it to see if there's a problem with this browser, for example, that kind of thing. So we don't really want to check information uh, from uh, three months ago. And having two different buckets, we can define different policies for the different kind of information and control even more the uh, cost of this solution. So now, yes, <laughs> we consider that we have a solution that works, is solving the needs that we had, it is proving that it can scale with the amount of information because the system has grown a lot, and uh, now it's allowing us to uh, store and process more than three terabytes per day. So, <laughs> any question? <laughs> okay, I'll try. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah. The replication factor that we have for uh, for these uh, topics is two. Uh, yeah, I don't know if in Kafka we have changed the configuration for that, so I would need to check what's the 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 default because I don't. Do, do you know what's the default event? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. The good thing is that we seldom had any issue with the uh, uh, Kafka server. It's quite stable. It was one of the worries that we had, and then we started gradually adding information to it. We didn't switch everything uh, uh, from zero to 100%, uh, but we started processing only some of the uh, reporting events. And at the beginning, we had some problems because of the uh, leader uh, memory, but we tuned it a bit and everything worked pretty smooth uh, from that point. So that's the good thing. I, I would need to ensure if we are forcing the, the ACK AC 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 um, before uh, ensuring that it's to both replicas or, or it's only a leader. I, I would need to check that now. Wow. <laughs> Uh, 
Kafka Connect instead of uh, Spark. No, I, I have not tried uh, Kafka Connect. So I don't know exactly the, the advantages that it could provide. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Now in our case, uh, going with the Spark was also a kind of link to going uh, with something that was in between, like why we decided to go with Kubernetes, something that was in between. Uh, we already had the cluster prepared with Dataproc, so we didn't need to worry about that. They were going to provide it, and we only needed to worry of the applications that we run inside. Uh, Oh, the, uh, you mean the, what? The, the repartition, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, co coalesce here. here. Now, in this case, what it's doing is that it has uh, more uh, partitions before this point, depending, for example, uh, on the uh, Kafka uh, partitions that you are using. So you can improve the parallelism of the uh, ingest of the files. But at this point, the whole information that has been generated is going to be uh, split in 10 parts. We are not going to have 10 files per day, but we are going to have 10 files per execution. In our case, it's 10 every 10 minutes. Or if we change the execution to five minutes, then we will have. So what it's doing is taking all the messages generated and dividing them in only 10 uh, parts. <laughs> now it's temper execution and in our case we play with that because we know that even if we grow we are not going to duplicate well who knows <laughs> but we are not going to really duplicate from one day to another so we can have an eye and decide at some at some point we uh, know now more or less as we know the total size of the folder we know mm, the size that is being generated more or less every every hour, and we know that it's now it's usually around uh, 500 uh, megabytes, I think. Uh, so we can play, and at some point maybe we will increase this. In the end, it's also uh, a trade-off, the performance of the other task, but also having something manageable here. Question. Okay. It's not uh, having uh, to, to no. It's not that we had two checkpoints. Is that uh, the right stream? They generate some part of the checkpoint information here at the checkpoint location, but it is not checkpoint, but it's kind of the progress of the generated information. It's also a store beside the uh, the uh, oh the information uh, again okay, here here the the path itself. So I think that I. I This is 
for example no because you are not going to see the information that it's inside you are only going to see <laughs> nah, nah, nah. <laughs> you're only going to see the structure that I already told so <laughs> that's not an issue <laughs> and the files <laughs> but it's also is storing some metadata information here and well yeah inside the uh, different uh, folders there are also information about the uh, the generated parts so if you switch to a new one that information is not going to match it's kind of something like that and that's why uh, one of the uh, ne the things that you need to to take into account is that if you want to ever change one, you will need to change both, or they are not going to match, and then it is going to get completely crazy. <laughs> Well, the uh, Spark cluster is completely outside. It, it, it's a data pro cluster. It's one service that Google provides. So they control the cluster and they, they handle it. And you don't need to worry about the maintenance of the cluster. It's not providing really a lot of things in the case of a uh, uh, Spark cluster, but it helps us not to worry too much about some things. And also Kafka. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we have Kafka outside of the of Kubernetes. We had used some Kubernetes feature uh, that is the stateful set that is supposed to be for these kind of things, but we use it for Redis. And even with that, we had some issues with the restart, um, that kind of things. So we don't really want to have that kind of uh, strategy. And as we don't really need the uh, scaling, for example, abilities that Kubernetes provide us for uh, uh, the Kafka uh, cluster, because we are not going to scale it automatically. Uh, and we can handle taking care of uh, restarting if we have any kind of issue one with one node that, as I said, that seldom happened. Uh, so we didn't really see any need on trying to migrate everything inside the cluster of Kubernetes. Yeah. <laughs> well, sure. In the end, we, we didn't have any, we, we needed to unshare because in the past, uh, for some of the microservices that are communicating through messages, depending on the library, you can also define the limits of the size. So it happened to us there that sometimes uh, you could only notice that suddenly one of the partition it was stuck, and the messages were not processed. But at the beginning, we didn't really know why. And after that, we we discovered that it was because of that, because the message was too big, and the library that we were using to read uh, had this limit lower than the size of the message being generated. So the message could not really be uh, be uh, could not really uh, be processed or being fetched. So it was completely stuck there and you needed to discard it. Uh, it was kind of a mess. That's why we had some worries that that could happen. But we made some tests and we have seen that with the connector that we have with, uh, with Spark, that's not an issue. Um, yeah. It's working fine. Uh, the max size of the at the moment, well, I don't remember. I, I can check it later because I have the, we have a lot of charts displaying everything, the amount of events that we are processing 
and the uh, amount of bytes that are being processed for every topic at any moment. So I can check it later and tell you the average of the size that we are having at the moment. But I can ensure that the size of the uh, debug uh, path, they are more than double, it's almost, I think that's three times the size of the messages from that we were previously uh, processing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you again? <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, you can ask. <laughs> At the moment, we have not really needed that. You shouldn't have any problem except of paying more because you are accessing uh, information that shouldn't be bad. The uh, uh, importing time shouldn't really be affected, I think, because they still have, uh, it's uh, still connected through the same network. Something that you need to check also is the zone that you are using to store the information and for your BigQuery table because you need to ensure that you are working on the same zone or you would have also charges because of uh, sending data <laughs> from one zone to another. <laughs> Things to consider. But I think that the time shouldn't really be an, an issue. We didn't really need it yet and we don't really expect to need it that much. It's more like a kind of safe to 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 leave it for uh, at least five months there in case something happened. But at the moment, with the processing information, they are having enough after that time. Uh -huh. <laughs> Any other question? Well, thank you. <laughs> And we are hiring someone for to work on the <laughs> it's to work on the client, I'm sorry. <laughs> but if you know someone that could be interested in working with it because we look someone who knows about JavaScript but and it's going to be